This is gonna hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. podcast. Our destiny is written well before we realize what it is. Sometimes it's right in front of our face. Often it's hiding in plain sight and may even be hidden in a location you never thought to look. Our job as we grow is to search. When we find our path, it just feels right. There will be doubt, there will be suffering, but there will always be realignment because everything you do leads you in the direction you're supposed to travel. Along that journey, apathy, is a destiny killer. Each day we must strive to be better than we were the previous one. The only way to maximize your place in this world is to work and grow. I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felace and welcome to The Suffering Podcast. If you're a fan of overcoming adversity and overcoming suffering, then we're for you because that's the stories we highlight and that's what we do here. So do me a favor, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, please comment, ring the bell so you can get notified of all of our new content. Now you can join. Follow us on all social media so you can find out what we're up to. And on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we welcome in a weary traveler all the way from sunny California. Yeah, what brings you to Jersey? Jeez. <laughs> and you should have invited us out there. We would have come did the show from there. Damn, it was raining all day. <laughs> and tonight we welcome Kenneth Strange to discuss the suffering of the Secret Service. Kind of gives it away what we're going to talk about. He yeah, I was wondering a- what he was here for. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we were honored to have you in here. Thank you so much for coming. You're tonight. welcome. You're welcome. Before we get into anything, let's throw a big shout out to our marquee sponsor. That's Toyota of Hackensack. We don't trust anybody as police, but we do trust them. So go to toyotahackensack.com and let them find you a car. So, Ken, each week we take a question from our audience. This question comes from Finger626. Was there ever a time in your career that you got it wrong? You spent a long time in enforcing the law in one form or another in many different aspects, and you're a human being. So your assumptions start off one way, and you're going down a path, and next thing you know, you're like, oh, man, I really got that one wrong. Did that ever happen to you? Uh, Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So I'm in the FBI. I'm on the JTTF in uh, Newark, Newark, New Jersey. And uh, we had uh, some Middle Eastern fella uh, call into the, I think it was the White House or um, someplace, and, uh, or he may have even been in touch with the Iraqis, and we had intercepted it. Uh, and it was kind of like what he was going to do to the uh, Bushes, uh, the father, uh, George Herbert Bush. And so, um, you know, he said, uh, you know, I-, I can smoke the guy, I can smoke the president and some other uh, congressman and a, maybe a senator, whatever. So uh, that got our attention, and uh, especially because we had a uh, on the JTTF, we had a Secret Service agent uh, there as as well. So uh, you know, he had a vested interest in this. So uh, you know, we kind of rolled out on this uh, phone. We you know found out where the phone call came, and we kind of were digging around. We found out this guy is uh, living in Rutherford, and uh, wow, and that? he's. Uh, and he's got like a uh, like a delicatessen a coffee shop or something in Newark, so uh, we were able to identify him and start surveillance. So um, you know, I, I speak uh, some Arabic. I lived in the Middle East, and uh, we had a um, acting supervisor at the time. So I'm I'm a new I'm the new guy, but I said, uh, hey, look, uh, I'll be happy to do kind of a limited undercover thing. All I have to do is you know get some books go down to his store, you know, walk in civilian clothes and say, I'm a graduate student, uh, you know, doing Arabic studies, something like that, and, and start talking to the guy. So they said, okay, you know, we'll, you know, we have units down there. They'll be watching you. Be careful. Uh, you know, get what you can. Come on back and we'll go from there. So I, I go down there. I walk into his uh, shop and I'm looking, you know, I'm looking around for things like, um, you know, Bush's, uh picture up there on a dark board board or something, you know, anything that uh, might give it away. But uh, in fact, uh, it was a very calm place. And uh, then I I saw the subject. His name is uh, Jamal. And so I kind of, you know, went into my Middle East thing, you know, how are you doing? Salaamu Alaikum, Kef Halak, all of this stuff, Uh, just chit chat in Arabic. And that got his attention, got his interest. And so he was like, oh, wow, you, you speak Arabic. That is so, uh, you know, I worked in Saudi Arabia. I was a teacher, which I was. Uh, yeah, that's how I picked up my Arabic. So we start talking, and I'm asking him, where are you from? 
you know, uh, he says, uh, Kuwait, uh, I was brought up in Kuwait. Oh, okay. And then, and then he starts divulging stuff because he feels comfortable with me and he doesn't suspect who I am. And he says, um, oh, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm ex-military. Uh, I, I was down at Fort, uh, Fort Benning. So I, I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. I'm in the, so I'm thinking, whoa, you know, that's, that's interesting. It's a pretty big deal. Good yeah. to know after the threats he's yeah. made, right? So uh, we had that. And then, you know, uh, we're just kind of talking, shooting the shit. And uh, he says, and this is just before the uh, Gulf War, uh, the first Gulf War, in, mm -hmm. like 90. 91. I 91. Think. It was yeah. 91. And so he says, you know, I, uh, I hate the Kuwaitis. I, you know, I'm really with Saddam Hussein on this. He's got, uh, you know, he's got every right to roll into Kuwait and take it over. They've, you know, those Kuwaitis, they're these rich people and they're spoiled and they've stolen the oil wells from the Iraqis. And so you could see where his, you know, his animus was, was coming from. So it all started to make sense. Um, and, and then he said, oh, you know, please, Mr. Mr. And, you know, I, I think I said I was Richard. Mr. Richard, please come back. I want to meet you again. And uh, I said, yeah, you know, I can do that. He goes, please, please. You know, he hands me a piece of paper. Please write your name, your, you know, your, your phone number. So I wrote, you know, Mr. Richard, uh, you know, my cover name. And then uh, <laughs> about all the way through writing my phone number, and I kind of looked at the phone number. And he took it and I said, oh, shit, that's my phone number, my real <laughs> phone number. I hadn't thought it all the way through. And I'm not worried about, you know, this clown. I'm worried about what's going to happen when I get back to the squad yeah. area. So, um, you know, so, uh, anyway, Masalama, let's stay in touch. Jamal, you know, as I see the surveillance, you know, the SOG units going around. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. Uh, so, so I get back into the, uh, you know, one, uh, I, guess, I guess it's um, down there in, by the train station where we used to, where we used to work. Now it's, I think, in another part of Newark. Uh, so I go up to the squad area. It's a C-10 squad, JTTF. And, uh, you know, well, and I said, well, you know, there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> now, here's the good news. Yeah. Uh, look, he, you know, he said this, 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 that. And, you know, and they're like, wow, you know, well, that's cool. That's good. That's good. Way to go, strange. And uh, uh, bad news? And I said, I gave him my real phone number. <laughs> oh, my God. The acting supervisor went through the, I mean, he just ripped me a new one. And I was, I, 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 you know, I, I knew it. I just kind of hung my head. Oh, shit. And so he went on and on and on. And the case agent, you know, he's kind of like, oh, damn it, the new guy. Strange. Yeah, aptly named. Uh, I was figured you'd get your balls yeah, busted more than anything yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, that, no, these, they, they, they were very serious. And, uh, you know, and, and then, this, then the supervisor said, you know, you, you put your whole family at risk. And, you know, okay, enough, enough, you know. Yeah. You know, and it, it just went on and on. And it was a, it was a hard lesson uh, to learn. You know, I should have thought it all the way through, uh, even taking the paper out of, his, out of the guy's hand. And, you know, look, let's start again. Yeah. But then you blow it. So you're trying to play <laughs> right? cool. Yeah, cool. Oh, that's my whole phone yeah, number right i just got a new phone <laughs> right. mike what do you think i never made a mistake what yeah 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 now we we had a when i was in the bureau we had a robbery investigation and i was dead set it was this one guy i was dead set i wasn't like even looking at other leads you know it was just you yeah. know when you get so fixated on sure something? sure tunnel this, vision there's the guy this I, I know it it, it fits his mo it's, it's this is the wasn't him Oh geez, jeez. <laughs> we never never locked him up or anything. You uh, know? Uh, but I was like, I said, you wasted I, I a lot of time doing wasted that. Wasted a hell of a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. You, you know where I first noticed it uh, when I was brand new. I walked into a domestic. That's basically we had a lot of domestics, Ooh. and the the woman comes up to me, and I'm not ragging on men or women or anything. It's not about that. But the woman comes up to me. I want a domestic. I, I want a TRO. I want a TRO. I want a temporary restraining order. And I'm a new officer. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, I get the story. I'm like, we start going through the paperwork and stuff. And years later, I see the guy is just, he just, it destroyed his life. But I find out the truth later on through different avenues that the woman, this was a, this was a well thought out plan by her oh, to whoa. get the TRO, to get him out of the house. Uh, okay. And, and it taught me something. You know, I was so fixated on trying to protect the, the woman in a domestic violence incident. I didn't look at the big picture of everything. And I, I came back and, and it, it sort of skewed me a little bit. So my, my rule of thumb was if somebody comes up running to get a temporary restraining order. Yeah, yeah. I'll look at it a little closer. If, sure. if I, but 
the one the one that I take very seriously is that woman who goes, no, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do anything. I don't mm-hmm. want to do anything because right. they're the ones who really, yeah. really, the need, ones who really it, need it, right? They need yeah. it. Yeah. You know, now, there's 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 a couple of them. You know, you, you lock this person up for drunk driving or doing something like that, and you watch their life spiral spiral out of control, sure, well. knowing that you had a little hand in it. And I don't. Yeah. I, I never felt good about yeah, that. I that see. bothered me a lot. Yeah. I, I, I can see that happening, especially yeah. you know because I lived in the town that I worked in. So, you know, you were, sometimes you were locking up people. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you would. You know, you we, knew we went on a domestic. <clears throat> we'd, we'd go in there, and the guy goes, yeah, I just found out my, my wife's uh, having sex with her high school boyfriend. Oh, jeez. Oh, my God. You were a high school boyfriend? No, no, no. <laughs> the next day, I go to my son's Little League game, and here's yeah. the two parents. I, I know, it's they're, awkward. They're, it's they're awkward, playing right? Little League. The kid, oh, my their God. son plays Little League with yeah. well, my son. It's, you're yeah. thrust into other people's lives, yeah. and it's just like. Yeah, you know all their secrets, yeah. right? Wow. But, but you learn those things, and that takes experience. And right. it's experience that when you're brand new out there, you, you have a lot of book knowledge, but you just don't have the street experience. That's right. And yep. it, it takes some time. Yeah, sure. It takes some time. Absolutely. So Finger626, thank you for sending that one in. Keep sending in your questions. We will try to get them on the air. And we want all of our audience to go to Cubita, Cubita Cafe, 234 Franklin Avenue in Nutley. They have the most delicious food there, top-level chef. Mike was just there. Yeah, I was there about... A couple weeks ago now. A couple weeks. Um, and their empanadas are all handmade. Empanadas are all handmade. The, the dough is all handmade. He makes everything right right on location. It's wow. fantastic. Not only is the food good, but Fresh. he treats you like gold. So go to Cubita Cafe, 234 Franklin Avenue in Nutley. Check them out. They support us, and we want you to support them. So, Ken, you know, we've been in talks for a while right. to try to get you in here. And we're trying to we're trying our best to coordinate because you're traveling. You got you got your yeah. book, A Cop's Son, coming out or it's already out. And um, we're trying to get you in here and the stars aligned. Yeah. So it, are. It, it, amazing. I just happened to be on the East Coast. And I remember we talked. I was in Wyoming and, you know, watching yeah. the sun go down. And, <laughs> I was at my son's birthday party. That the first was it. That was you. it. Right. Yeah. And I was listening to you watching the antelope actually roaming the property. <laughs> uh, and, and yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I saw you guys, heard a lot about you and, uh, you, you know, you seem like terrific uh, people. So I just want to. That's not what you said to me before. before. Well, anyway. <laughs> we're sorry to, we're sorry to ruin that perception of you once you meet us in person. Hey, you're okay. You guys are okay. But it's, it's a weird web that we have these personal connections. Like yeah. we know this person and you know this person and we right. sort of connect and that's kind of yeah. how, you know, you. Yeah, 172 episodes. Yeah, that yeah. we've come to meet all these different people. Yeah, what is it? Those six degrees of separation. Yeah. Oh, Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. Something yeah. like that. Six degrees. I'm really good at that game, by the way. So I'm just. <laughs> I, I just. I, I got a memory. My memory's fading, but it, it's still. Kevin's good. like an idiot savant. Yeah. Oh. You know, hey. I, I, mainly I, just an idiot. To mainly but... just an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. So you traveled all this way. Why, where'd you grow up? So um, you know, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn, um, you know, lived, uh, lived there for about 15, 15 years and, you know, middle class, lower middle class uh, type uh, upbringing. I lived in a row, a row house, you know, a little tiny little place. Uh, Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst. Uh, no, uh, Marine Park. <clears throat> yeah, Marine Park. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, went to uh, like a Catholic elementary school and, um, you know, my father was a NYPD guy and uh, my mother was from Bay Ridge. Uh, so yeah, so I, I kind of grew up in the city and, you know, played box ball and stick ball stick and, ball the street. And, 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 yeah. Or, you know, when my dad came home from work, he would actually, you know, come on, let's, let's throw the football around in the street, you know, and then we have these little tag, uh, tag football games and touch football. I, I often marvel at people who grew up in the city and I'm talking about New York city and I can't speak to any, any place else. I, I marvel at those people cause it's such a chaotic world to me. I'm a, I'm a. Listen, even even in Atlantic City, it's nothing like New York City. There's still some parks and greenery and yeah. places to go. Uh, I just, but everybody who does it says they love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you always had uh, friends. You know, you'd knock on doors. Some people could come out, others, uh, you know, wouldn't come out. But you'd always have uh, two or three friends and, you know, you could do stuff uh, together. I saw one of those things on Instagram the other day that said, like, uh, if you played football in the street and you yelled car, that's when you. That's when yeah. you knew. That's yeah. when you knew you had oh, a good childhood. Oh, geez. Uh, you know, I could write a book about these uh, childhood experiences. Yeah. 
playing roller hockey, yeah. you know, and uh, watching the puck go down the sewer. And then we had a guy named Louie who was the sewer rat, and we put him down there and he come up. <laughs> that with was a, me. That was, that was all right. You know what I'm talking about? Small, I was always yeah. the smallest yeah, kid. Yeah, yeah. Well, so they always yeah. sent me down the sewer to go get the ball. You got the, you got the puck, which is really <laughs> nothing more than tape, right? Yeah. My son and I were watching Wayne's World. And in Wayne's world, they're playing hockey out in the street. And the car, and they yeah. move that thing, and the game on. And my son looks at this like it's some sort of foreign yeah. ritual. Oh, yeah. That that was growing up. Yeah. They don't yeah. do that anymore. No. I, yeah, that's what I heard. You know, I, I live near a cul-de-sac, and they play basketball in the cul-de-sac, so they never have to worry about cars coming or anything right, like that. Right, that's right. So it, But it seemed like a lot of fun. Uh, from everybody I've spoken to who grew up in the inner city, sure, it's they see it, they they love it. They yeah. move out, yeah. They move out because they don't want their kids to grow up like that right. for whatever reason, right? Yeah, and that's what happened with my father. You know, I guess I was about fifteen or so, and he said, "Look, you know, uh, there's a place out in Long Island. You know, I think there's just more greenery out there." And uh, he was into sailboats anyway, so uh, he said, "Come on, let's let's move." Well, he where so where where was he where was what was his precinct? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he was all over the city, but uh, I remember him mostly um, uh, growing up in Motorcycle Precinct Number Two over on Flatbush Avenue. That was perhaps the happiest I've ever seen him in his life as a cop, uh, because uh, he loved he loved motorcycles, loved driving around on them, and and um, you know he was telling me he said, motorcycle is clean. And I, I said, Pop, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, there's corruption in, in you know, where I work. Oh. Um, and so, but motorcycle, there's nothing, little if nothing going on. And I like that. I like that environment. That's, what's the time frame we're talking about here? So, um, you know, he's there in the mid-60s to, you know, uh, maybe 72, something like that. Ken, those poor guys, they're making... Six seven thousand dollars a okay. year. Yeah, they're making yeah. nothing. Yeah, yeah. I remember he had a um, kind of a part time, um, you know, on a on a on call basis with a, a local um, paint store, and uh, it's the first time I saw these incredible sixty four you know box of sixty four crayons. Like <laughs> I'm like, whoa! There's a sharpener in the back. Yeah, the sharpener. You know, and I said, wow, these that's rich. You know, we never get yeah. those, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, he did that once in a while. Um, yeah, just to make ends meet there for a while. Yeah, it's. I I can imagine that the city wasn't cheap back then. Yeah. Um, yeah. No good. But once you got out to Long Island, like what changed for you? He he's obviously still commuting into the city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, but what changed for you growing up? Uh, well, again, I'm in. Uh, so I'm in a boys Catholic high school for about a year and a half, uh, Nazareth High School over on Canars in Canarsie, fifty seventh and D. So when I get out to a uh, Bayport. You know where the Hardy Boys mm -hmm. is supposedly yeah. from. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Troy yeah. Donahue was from. <laughs> yeah. um, all of a sudden, I'm with girls. There were girls, wow. cute girls. Look at this. Here goes yeah. the world yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not paying any more attention. <laughs> and, and you're 15 years and old. And I'm 15, raging and uh, you're not, hormones. You're not playing stickball in the street <laughs> no, anymore. No more box ball. <laughs> no, no, no girls. You know. So. But you looking at your father coming home every yeah. day. Yeah. Was it a source of pride? Did you know uh, they're not making much money, and police weren't looked at back then. Yeah. It wasn't they were looking at they were looked at poorly. No. But it's not like it is today where, oh, he's a cop. Okay, he's he's okay. Yeah, yeah. He was a, a, a really good guy. He actually he was a remarkable person. Um, you know, he was kind of like a cop, but he wasn't a cop because he had like other interests. Uh, you know, he could um he could sketch, he, you know, he did uh boating, you know, he was a voracious reader. Uh at one time in his life uh, he was um uh, going into the monastery. He was going to be a Trappist monk. Uh, it was a difficult time in his life. but So he was well-read, and he knew a lot of, a lot of stuff. And uh, he could sing, he could dance, he knew Broadway. I mean, the, the guy, he was kind of remarkable. He was a very impressive guy. Well-rounded. Well-rounded. And, Mike, and when he took, like, the tests, like a sergeant, lieutenant, all that, he was always finishing, like, the top five because he had, like, a photographic memory. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he studied hard, you know, mm -hmm. and when he's studying for these tests, you wouldn't bother him. Yeah. You know, mom would say, stay away from him. Stay out of his way. It's test time. It's test time. <laughs> exactly. Did he but, make, did he eventually make rank? Yeah. Uh, so he was there uh, 38 years and he finished. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And he finished up as a deputy chief. 
Oh, good uh, for him. Yeah. So he was buddies with, um, you know, Ray Kelly. They were friends. And, you know, when Ray Kelly went out on his book tour, my dad was with him for a little bit. Uh, so, you know, and he was friends with Mayor Koch and, you know, uh, luminaries like that. So it's that clean officer image. Yeah. 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 But, um, you know, he started amazingly. He started, um, he was in the army for like two years during the Korean war, but he, you know, he was stateside and then he went into the police department and, um, he was chosen to join the glee club, (laughs) the glee club. He was in the police glee club and and he was saying to me, that didn't go over well with the other guys yeah, in the... Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, you know, now the <clears throat> NYPD's got the dance team, which is getting torn, I heard. Getting torn to yeah, shreds. I heard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many problems yeah. in New York City right now that they got to worry yeah. about a dance, dance team. Yeah. And that's, uh, wow, the police glee club. I don't even yeah, think that, that was, exists. That was like the details to get into, though, you know? It was. Get... It was, yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, the, he was telling me, uh, you know, the... Commanding officer would say, you know, Mulroney, you'll be walking beat. You're on this. And, you know, you're in uh, car 54 uh, Higgins and strange. You're in the Glee Club. <laughs> so it didn't go. But you, I guess you get to go to all the cool events. Yeah, exactly. he did. That's, that's what I was saying. It was, he did. Know. Yeah. Networking before networking. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. But it only lasted six months uh, because NYPD saw to it that uh, it would be disbanded. Uh, they needed more uh, street cops. So uh, he, he said, regrettably, they shut it down because it was kind of a an esprit de corps thing that, you know, a lot of people were proud of the Glee Club. So he said, it's too bad it was shut down. But, you know. Well, they have the pipe, the pipe band. Yeah, true. So that's right. The, I mean, the pipe band is no different than the Glee Club. Right. And that, that is looked at very differently. I mean, we're again, we're looking at the past through future eyes. Mm hmm. Cops singing in harmony. You know, I'm thinking barbershop quartet. And <laughs> yeah. it's just, it doesn't yeah. sound real good, but put a well, bunch of guys out there with bagpipes. Yeah. That's but pretty, it, that's pretty damn cool. There was a movie yeah. out years ago called Choir Boys, wasn't it? It was all about cops who were singing and all that. Yeah, I, I didn't see that one. Yeah. I've heard about that yeah. one. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a, a guy who I follow on Instagram. I've spoken to a guy named Frankie Ray. He was a cop in, um, I think, uh, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And now he's this big country music star. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. He, he was able to actually leave police work to yeah, go yeah. follow this dream. Sounds like Eddie Money. Well, think yeah. if you think about Yeah, right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I forgot Eddie yeah. Money was. Yeah. But if you think about it, I, I, not so much in the city, but I don't know about you, Mike. I'm driving around in my car on midnights and I'm listening to the radio. I'm singing at the top of my lungs. <laughs> but nobody asked you to be in a Glee Club. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so you move on. <clears throat> Did, was there ever a pull to to join the NYPD? Did your father sit? Because there's two ways fathers yeah, go. It's either sure. follow me yeah, or yeah. stay the hell away yeah. from what I'm doing. Yeah. Become a fireman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, he... Uh, you know, I always had an interest in law enforcement um, and, and, you know, I, I'd let him know that. And he said, you know, that's that's cool. That's great. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, you have a college education. You know, I, I sent you to school. But so, you know, there are other options, too, with law enforcement. He said, uh, you know, there's the feds like uh, Secret Service, FBI, you know, so you got NYPD and other options. So, you know, think it think about think it all the way through type thing. So. Well, what what was the allure of being a cop oh, or being, I, well, being a law enforcement? I, I, well, look, I got to be honest with you guys. For me, I'm a big movie guy. So, you know, I'm watching Dirty Harry. I'm, <laughs> I'm watching uh, the, the French Connection, the Seven Ups. Uh, you know, I I ate that stuff up. You know, you know, I was like learning all the lines for Dirty Harry. I could do all these. Imp- you know, I, so that that was a lot of that was the allure. You know, these guys are cool. They're dynamic. They're brave. They're they're kind of on the edge sometimes. I kind of like that. Yeah, you, you know yeah, exactly. And I'm not an on the edge type person, so that kind of was wow. That's that's yeah, cool so stuff. It, it, it had some allure to you, yeah, because that yeah. wasn't you. Yeah, yeah. sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. So you know, when, you when, when I'm when I'm in the Arab neighborhood in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, and I go in there with my business cards, and all of a sudden I'm thinking Popeye Doyle, where he goes into the bar. Yeah. Hey, hey, I, I'm strange here, strange here. Everybody, up, up, up. You know. This is cool. I'm actually doing that. We're reliving this, and all these all these Arab guys are watching CNN with Scud missiles hitting our people in Saudi Arabia, and they're yelling. And I know Arabic, and they're yelling, "Go Scud, go!" So I just went. I, fl- I was with a partner. I just flipped, and I said, 
hey, everybody up, you know, and I start throwing my cards all over. You know, I'm coming back here. I'm watching you guys, you know, and I walked out going, holy shit, that was, that was Gene Hackman back there. <laughs> but we were pissed off that this was happening in our country, you know. Oh, yeah. That, I remember that very clearly. Yeah. So the French Connection, we, we Mike and I have a, a connection to the French Connection. No. So Joseph Imbruglia, who was involved in the French Connection. Yeah. Our friend Charlie Cifarelli's father... Right. Worked very closely with Joseph and Broglia. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's our connection to the French connection. Right, right. And, yeah, my dad's uh, friend was Eddie Egan, who was yeah. actually played a role in that in the oh, movie. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. He was an actor at the end. So you go? Where'd you go to college? So I went to uh, Lemoyne College. It's up in uh, Syracuse. Yeah, Syracuse. It's a Jesuit uh, school. Pretty, pretty cold place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot of snow. <laughs> Lots of snow. Yeah, you kind of could just take summer classes up there. <laughs> <laughs> I it still snows in the summer in Syracuse. Yeah, yeah I, I know. Hey, it was our uh, senior uh, clam bake, and uh, it was snowing. Yeah. You know, this was in May. I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm yeah. never coming back. I don't know. That's that's really yeah. Syracuse is really really far. Yeah, that, in Buffalo. That's forget it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Forget it. So you, we but you go to, through Syracuse to go to Oswego. Yes. To go fishing. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, for salmon? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, so a friend of mine had a, sa a boat, and we used to go salmon fishing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's beautiful in the uh, fall, uh, but, you know, the winter just sucks. Yeah. Just I mean, they, they had the one year where they had, like, 16 feet of snow. I, I, right. And, yeah. yeah, we were actually going across the street, like, in tunnels, like snow tunnels. And I said, this is ice station zebra stuff. So yeah. This is crazy. And I, you know, I always said they have, like, some elevated roadways there. What do they do with that snow? You look out below. <laughs> Pushing the snow yeah. over the side with yeah, the plow. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure they get one or two deaths covered with sure. snow. Yeah. So, but what did you study in college? Was it, did you stay on that path for law enforcement? No. Uh, so I, I actually, um, and, and and I got to blame my dad for this again. Uh, so I got into languages. Uh, Spanish was the one. You know, you saw me with Angel mm -hmm. hanging out mm -hmm. there. But um, yeah. So I. So what happened is, you know, we're living in Brooklyn in this house, and I uh, one morning. I wake up and I hear this, uh, like, uh, this guy, the Spanish guy's voice down the basement, uh, Isabel, uh, Jorge. And, and I'm, what the, what's going on down there? So I open the door. My father, my father is down there with this kind of uh, record player and he's studying Spanish and he's repeating these names. So I said, dad, what's this? He says, I'm studying Spanish. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, the people in the precinct, we have a few Hispanic people and you know, the barbers down there on the junction, Nostrand and Flatbush, you know, they cut hair. They're from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. And I want to be able to talk to them. So come on and join me. So I did. And That's a great cop right there. Yeah. 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 Weave yourself into the fabric of your neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that, yeah, no, yeah, for sure. And uh, so I, I liked it. And it, to me, it was like music. The language is like music. So uh, that the first chance I could take, uh, you know, I took a Spanish course in high school in Brooklyn, loved it. And, you know, there was no turning back. So it became my major in college and um you know i took a junior year abroad in madrid spain for for a year and uh you know just kept going on and on and now i was hoping to be like a spanish teacher so that's that's where that was going but still in the back of the mind i still like i was interested in law enforcement and and i would always be i'm a literature major oh, okay and, okay and i i went to college for literature and I went to postgrad for literature and stuff like this. And then I become a cop and everybody will say, well, you, you did it. Cause I wanted to be a teacher. Right. Okay. And well, you, you went through all that education. What a waste. And I said, listen, my reports are rock solid. <laughs> so it is not a waste by any means. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. too many people who want to get into police work, they, they're, I got to go criminal justice. I got to go right. criminal justice. Yeah, sure, and sure. You know, yeah. I don't know whether it's the best move. So, you know, right after college, I'm looking for a job and it wasn't going very well. And But in the meantime, I was kind of seeding the local high schools, Long Island, with my resume. Uh, so about halfway, you know, halfway through that, that year, I think it was like January, I got a call from one of these uh, monks at LaSalle Military Academy, Christian Brothers. And uh, they said, hey, we, we need a Spanish teacher like yesterday. Uh, and it turns out the Spanish teacher was allegedly dealing on a school, on a field trip <laughs> with the students that's that's frowned upon so you know his sometimes yeah so anyway that opened it kind of opened the door for me and i you know i jumped at the chance i said yeah absolutely i'll, I'll go there so but but the pay was uh like eight thousand 
eight thousand four hundred dollars a year. Mm. Well, but but you got a free lunch. Uh, you know, the monks had the a cook, so you got a free lunch. That, that, that oh, makes it worth it. Yeah, yeah. That'll save you ten dollars yeah. a day. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, but it was a, a very interesting uh, school. It was a private military academy. You know, uh, Christian brothers, and we had uh, uh, a lot of foreigners. In, in the school, we had, uh, I mean, apart from like Willie Mays's son, and uh, we had the uh, the Shah of Iran. We had some of his uh, Riza rel- Pahlavi relatives, some of those people. Uh, How the hell do I remember Riza Pahlavi? I told you, you're an idiot savant. He knows a lot of stuff. This he guy does. is uh, trivia. I could tell he'd be <laughs> tough in trivia. Yeah, I do. I do well in trivia. I know you do. Trivial pursuit. I could tell. Um, yeah. So there were uh, Gambinos. There were a lot of mafia uh, kids yeah. and grandkids there at the school. Uh, then we had um, yeah, Somoza, uh, you know, from Nicaragua and his grandchildren, you know, the dictator of Nicaragua at the time. OK. So his people were there. And, you know, all of these uh, very and a lot of Venezuelans with a lot of money at the time when it was rich, when it was rich. So the monks said, hey, you teaching Spanish to the American kids. We have a lot of foreigners here. Would you consider teaching English as a second language? And I said, mm, I'm not really that interested in doing that. But they go, please, please do it. So. So, OK. I'll try it out. And then they financed uh, some of my, um, uh, you know, English uh, teaching certificates over at Stony Brook University. So, I, you know, I went there at night to get a few of these. And so now I'm teaching Spanish and English as a second language. And that becomes important because, um, you know, after I do two years with them and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take a job in the Bronx at a junior high school, which goes south. It just it goes south on me. Um, I take a job in the Middle East as a teacher in Saudi Arabia. So I, I, one of my, it was a Will. My, my friend Will's brother was over in United Arab Emirates mm. as teaching English as a second language. Right. And I think he did pretty well, but, yeah. and then that went south when relations started going bad and they had to get out. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, for me, it was, again, language. So, you know, now, I can, now I'm learning Arabic. So, and, you know, I'm thinking, think, you know, out in the future, JTTF, and I'm, I'm in a country teaching Arabic. And I'm also uh, at a school for the royal family. So I'm, you know, with uh, King Faisal's grandkids, and I'm at the palaces, and I'm really kind of soaking all this in. And for, you know, a young American guy, uh, and there were some pretty beautiful princesses running around, too, but you had to be very careful there, very careful. Uh, <laughs> you I get mean, something chopped off. I, yeah, I mean, that and, yeah. Both heads. <laughs> there you go. The other head, well, anyway. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm there five years, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in that direction. I meet my wife over there as well. Uh, she's a stewardess for the Saudi Arabian Airlines, so... Um, and, and is she Saudi as well? No, she's from the Philippines. Okay. And her background was in nursing, but she said, you know what? I want to, I want to see the world before I become a nurse. So that's, that's what happened. But, uh, you know, I'm there less than a month and and the whole world seemed like the middle East was just exploding everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm there for like a month or two months and, uh, Mecca, the, the rebels see, sees Mecca. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, the, the Mahdi, the next, Christ for the Arabic world has come. <clears throat> He's a former National Guard, and he has all these rebels that are ex-soldiers, and they just wipe out everyone in the mosque, and now there's this huge siege. What year uh, are we talking about here? This is 1979. Okay. So, you know, I'm in my apartment. I'm seeing all these C-130 Hercules with the Saudi emblem coming in. They're flying in, and we have nurse nurse friends uh, at the military hospital and mostly British, British gals, and th- so they're telling us oh my God, the, the, these soldiers are all chewed up. The, you know, their legs are off. It's just horrible what's, yeah, what's sure. going on. So, you know, that was going on. And, uh, you know, after a few weeks, uh, the Saudis got it under control and they uh, beheaded like 70 people in cities all over. And I got invited to one of these things. Beheadings? Beheading, and I, I said, no. Uh, because it's something I, I don't think you can unsee. Yeah, I, something I, like that. I got to be honest with you. Yeah. If I'm thinking about that. Yeah. <clears throat> when is the next chance you're going to have chance to go see a live execution? I mean, as gory as it sounds, yeah, yeah. It, it's almost. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I could have turned it down. And I'm not. Yeah. I'm not glorifying what what That's happened. Sadistic. No, 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 no. I get it. You know, it's curiosity. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Yeah, a, a, absolutely. And uh, you, you know, and the Saudis are very severe. So, you know, this won't happen again. Uh, type thing. So, and at the same time, we had our hostages in Iran. 
Uh, so this yeah. is going on. And then the uh, Iran hostage crisis with the Argo situation. There you go. Yeah. Exactly right. And then uh, Ben Affleck did a great job getting them out of there. That was a great movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, at the, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, they had French legionnaires were in there, uh, you know, consulting with the Saudis on how to take back the mosque and, and, and all that. So and then our embassy, there was a rumor that the, that the CIA had actually um, been uh, responsible for the uh, siege, uh, the siege at Mecca. Uh, for the rebels. And so the uh, in Pakistan, they burned down our embassy and they killed some of our people. So all of this was kind of p- playing out. And then Iran, Iraq went to war at the same time period. So uh, you're in a powder keg. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm sitting in a powder keg. This is one volatile region. And now I'm meeting Sunnis and Shiites as well. And they don't mix together very well. So so for me, this was a tremendous learning experience. And when I got out, when I left after five years, the first place I go is Egypt. And most people, when they go to Egypt, you know, they're there on the Nile or seeing the pyramids and all that normal. No, I go to where Sadat was, that was uh, killed. I, go, I said, take me to the grandstand. I want to see where Sadat was murdered by the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. So that's my mindset. And that's what kind of happened with me. It's a similar mindset. So police have a, a morbid curiosity. We talk yeah. about the beheading. And as, as much as I wouldn't want to see that would be as much as I didn't, I, I couldn't undo that. Have you ever run into that where you just, I want to see where this happened. Like when I was in Chicago, I went to where John Wayne Gacy's house is. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I'm, I'm yeah. cause it, to me, yeah. to me, I like to touch history. Sure. It's funny you say that because I, I know a lot of cops that are that way. Right, right. It's, right. Yeah. You, you know, there in the town I worked in, there was a mob hit, and I could tell you right where it was. Right. And, and the house was built a certain way because it was a mob boss. It was right. done right at the end of the driveway. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It's a fascination thing. I, I don't know if that's it's a commonality amongst all people, but I've met a lot of people like that. So you, you know what? I got really taken aback by the Dakota. Where John oh, Lennon was Lennon, killed. Lennon, yeah, shot there. Uh, see, yeah. I've never been there. I've never yeah. been to the yeah, no. that's, that's crazy. I just walked by. Yeah, I just yeah. had this eerie feeling when yeah. I looked at it. I yeah, was for like, sure. That's right. Oh. Like, that's where history happened. Like, yeah. in Chicago, there was there was a couple hits. I had to go to where the former site of the Lexington Hotel. Right. I had to go see where yeah. the St. Valentine's Day Massacre was, which is just an empty lot. Right. And then where Dillinger was shot. Right. And that the Dillinger mm. was shot is actually really cool. Yeah. But, the Gacy house was the most morbid because oh, that's crazy. So it's it was like his address was like seventeen thirteen. Yeah, and they they took the house down because oh, they had yeah. to, they, they had, had to, to they had to get up. it up. Yeah. but so now it goes from seventeen eleven to seventeen fifteen, and they erased that number. Wow, amazing, yeah. amazing. Yeah, so it was pretty pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. How so cool is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's funny. You have to go see that stuff. Right. right. You still miss the beheading though. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the next life. <laughs> Catch the next one. Anyway, you know, stay around for a little while, man. Kevin or a little, you know, I'm I, got, chasing, I got the knife in the car. I'm chasing a princess. <laughs> and then they had an intervention by the other teachers saying, hey, let's cut it, cut it out with this uh, princess because, uh, you know, we can all get in a lot of trouble and you the worst. Oh, wait, you, you were trying to date one well, of the princesses? Well, you know, I had, uh, there was a princess that was uh, coming to be tutored by one of the um, wives of the of a fellow teacher. And so I just kind of bumped into her at at our villa. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden he sparks and chemistry. And, you know, this speaks English, beautiful, you know, and I guess the- Wealthy. Al- the allure of a princess. Wealthy. <laughs> but dangerous, yeah. very dangerous stuff. And, uh, you know, it was kind of an intervention. My uh, roommate said, hey, you cannot- you, you're going to screw it up for everybody here. So I had to, had to back off. Uh, actually, a good thing I did. Uh, the next guy that you dated her. Been, you could have been King Kenneth. You know, I could have been beheaded. <laughs> and I wouldn't be here. Uh, but she picked up with some French uh, professor and uh, he was he was deported. And she and uh, what I heard, she ended up in a like a mental hospital or something. So uh, kind of glad we. Yeah. Those guys kind of pulled back a little bit, a little bit. You got your friends to, to thank for that. Yeah. Thanks, friends. <laughs> <laughs> so. Eventually, it comes a time where your that little nagging draw to law enforcement right. becomes a reality. Right. Right. How, how did that happen? Right. So uh, when I finished up in Saudi Arabia, I uh, decided to go on for like a, a master's degree. And uh, I was looking at Columbia University, maybe, you know, international politics, something like that. And um, there was another school called Thunderbird School of Global Management in uh, Phoenix, I opted for that one, you know, like Arizona, sunshine. All Not as stuff. much snow as yeah, Syracuse. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 
And so I went there and, uh, you know, I took Arabic courses and Middle East courses and uh, took a Spanish commercial course. And You're just making yourself really <laughs> yeah. valuable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not knowing it, right? And um, then I got an internship with the State Department. And they, they sent me to uh, Muscat, Oman. Uh, and my wife became the nurse of the, uh, for a summer. But uh, so during this time, uh, this school, you know, they had a lot of people there that were... Um, you know, had language background, had been tra well traveled, uh, and so the CIA was going there pretty frequently to recruit, and then the FBI showed up, and so uh, this this one he was a Mormon uh, guy, Paul Mortensen, and uh, he gave a speech, and afterward I we we chatted, and he and I and he said, well, what's your background? And I said, well, and he said, you know, why don't you apply? I think you'd be perfect. You know, uh, stuff is happening in the Middle East, and you've got this background, and and I think you should maybe apply. You can apply. It's not the same guy who was uh, Joe Pistone's handler, was it? I because he was a Mormon too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there, there's a there's a bunch of Mormons uh, in the FBI, also in the CIA uh, as well. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe it could have been. I don't know. Because <laughs> it's finding a Mormon in law enforcement yeah. is is not. I didn't think it would be that common. Yeah. No, it is actually. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Yeah. I guess they're straight laced people. I don't, yeah. yeah. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't yeah. chase princesses. <laughs> <laughs> so you you get interviewed by FBI, right? All right, yeah. Like what? So you don't apply for the FBI. I guess you have to be chosen. You have to be recruited. Uh, I, I mean, in this case, it was kind of um, you know, both him and, and me. You know, we're in, we're both interested in in it. In it. Um, but you know, they they go out, they look at people, and um, and you can even you know, if you have any interest, you can just apply, and they'll look at your resume and talk to you. And, you know, go now from, go the, from there. you're going through this process. <clears throat> obviously, you tell your father. Yeah. And what'd your father say? Uh, you know, good luck. You oh, know, really? You know, good luck, son. If that if that's what makes you happy. But he was, you know, he was the type of guy that's, you know, if you want to be an engineer, go, go for it. If you want to be a literature professor, go for it. You know, it, it's just one of these kids to be happy. Uh, I, if my son ever wanted to become a cop, I, I'd sit down. And I think I'd have a talk with him. I'm I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, dissuade yeah. him because yeah. that, I think that's yeah. pointless. Yeah. You yeah. said I'd never get in the way of someone's dream, right? But yeah, I'll yeah. talk to you. I'll, yeah, <laughs> I'll talk to him. Right. Say, look, right. you're, get, you're getting in a job where you're always going to be the most unpopular guy in the room, right? Right. When you show, especially a municipal cop or something like that. No, until the day that the, the PBA cards come out, and then you're the most popular guy in the room. <laughs> exactly. Right. right. You're the exactly. most popular guy around. That's right. So you take the job? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it took a while because they're doing this extensive background investigation, and I'm not the typical, you know, I lived two places in my life. I'm, like, all over the place. So uh, they, it took a long time. It took about a year for them to complete complete my background. And then, you know, then I got an offer to to, uh, you know, go down to Quantico. And, and so I said, hey, okay, let, let's, let's do it. You know, it's kind of another door opens up in my life and, you know, I I'll, I'll take it. I think Quantico is one of those mythical places. Where everybody knows what Quantico is. Mm. He's heard of it. Yeah. 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 When you go through the FBI Academy, right? what's that like? Is it, I mean, you, you had some background because your father yeah. obviously went through some mm. form of an Academy. Mm -hmm. So you have some sort of metric. Is it, vastly different or is it very similar uh so you know I, I i couldn't really tell you you know exactly what my father went through as opposed to to quantico but uh it you know i was an older um i, I had joined at age 34 and the cutoff was 35 so i was a little older and i had a little more experience than my my classmates who were like in their mid late 20s yeah. type mm -hmm. thing and uh so kind of that was going on uh, I wasn't in the best physical shape, although I had deluded myself that I was because I could I could run 1.5 miles, yeah. e even though the the course was two miles. <laughs> you know? So um, and, and it became apparent uh, during our first uh, first exam, you know, the physical uh, fitness test. So I wasn't in the best of shape. Uh, pull ups were, you know, zero. I got a big zero. <laughs> hey, I'm a tall guy. That's what I kept telling myself. It's hard. But it's my understanding. They're not really focused as much on physical there, there's other things in there that they're yeah. looking at sure that you bring value to yeah yeah so we're you know we're taking legal courses and um you know physical fitness was a was a big one uh firearms is also pretty pretty big pretty important um you know we would do mock trials we do arrests uh, situational things like in hogan's alley you know the, the biograph theater we'd have a little <laughs> biograph theater dillinger yeah. right 
Yep. Uh, so all of that's going on. And then who shows up to, you know, decides to make a movie while I'm there. But, uh, you know, uh, Clarice Starling. Oh, Special Jody agent Foster. Clarice Starling. Well, they show her that one scene that Quantico shooting and I think yeah. it was raining out. When it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so she was uh, in our class. Uh, she attended uh, a lot of our classes. And she actually went on the, uh, on you know, this run with us. They call it the Yellow Brick Run. It's yeah, like, the Yellow Brick Run. It's like yeah. a 10K or something with um, obstacle courses and cargo nets and a wall. That thing. And she actually um, almost almost finished it. So, I, you know, I was like, you know, way to go, Jody. Uh, she wasn't very friendly, but... You know, I, I I did ask her. I was sitting with her on a bus, and I said, uh, "Miss Foster, uh, tonight we're going to have a few beers in in this in this place on campus." And she said, "No thanks," and just looked out, the, <laughs> looked out, maybe thinking of Hannibal Lecter. I don't know what she was thinking of. <laughs> the old Ed Gain story. Um, you get through. What's your first post? Uh, Newark. So I'm I'm at uh, Newark. Oh, you go right to Newark. Right to Newark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted New York, but. Um, uh, yeah, because it had this reputation of being the flagship and uh, Russian spies and all of this interesting work going on. But uh, it, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because uh, had I gone to New York, I would have made a little more money. But uh, I would have been, I think I would have been lost in the crowd. It was just so many agents over there. Uh, whereas Newark, which was nearer to my house, I was in North Plainfield at the time. Uh, Newark was a, a smaller uh, field office and uh, they decided to take me, you know, right into the JTTF, which even my boss said, this is unusual and uh, you shouldn't be here, he told me. Hmm. Talk about welcoming. Yeah. Right? Hey, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, Sorry, said, I'll go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, you should be on the applicant, uh, applicant squad, you know, doing what everybody else, what we all did. So I don't know how you got here, but OK, you know, we'll use you. So, so that, what was the draw to, you, to, to them bringing you on? They saw something in you. Yeah, the Middle East, Middle East terrorism. They said, you know, you've lived out there for five years. You speak uh, Arabic. You know the, you know the territory. So you're squared away. You yeah. passed all the background checks. Yeah, and you fit the profile that we need. Right. You know, it was like an anti-profile. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you get on the JTTF, and how did you use those skills you've learned throughout your right. your your life up to this point? Right. Did those skills come in handy? Absolutely. Yeah. A- absolutely. So, I, you know, I, I told you about that one instance where I, you know, I'm with this guy, you know, he's the subject and all of a sudden he's my best friend. So w- what happened with me is... Such a good friend you gave me your phone number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come party with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I spent most of my time uh, cultivating uh, informants from, uh, from the, you know, the Middle Eastern areas, Patterson, Jersey City, uh, those areas. And, uh, I, I actually was quite successful at, at doing that, but I had an advantage because again, I knew the culture, I knew the customs, I knew the language basically. So I had that advantage. Whereas the other people on my squad, you know, the bank robbery, uh, white collar fraud. So they were, you know, different things, uh, but not Middle East terrorism. So I was happy to kind of impart my wisdom to them. Yeah, so that's... You, you become an asset to that whole situation. And, you know, just meeting you in person, you don't come off as a person where I'm going to hold you down until you talk. No. You're a relationship type of type of cop. Yeah. yeah. Which is a, which is a, a valuable <coughs> asset in especially in something like JTTF. Yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, and again, I, I've always uh, adhered to the 80 20 rule, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, I'm I'm talking 20% of the time max, and you let them talk 80% of the time, whether they're hanging themselves or whether they're getting to be a, your buddy, yeah. uh, whatever whatever it is. So, um, and you know, and they they saw that I was comfortable with them. I never rushed them. It was always a relationship because you know I know that Middle Eastern people um, uh, are interested in, in forging relationships. So well, they value relationships. Right. Well, it sounds like they you do. do too. Yeah. Yeah. Forging yeah. relationships. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a people person. I, I admit that. Uh, yeah, and it's, it worked. It worked very well for me. And um, you know, there was uh, there was one. This is probably the um, um, the most satisfying uh, experience I had with uh, JTTF. I mean, we were running after. Um, uh, you know, there was the murder of Rabbi Kahani uh, by Said Nozer. You know, over in New Jersey, Palisades. Yep. 
I don't remember that yeah. one. Yeah, this, this is the beginning of Al-Qaeda, actually. You know, and all of a sudden, Said Nozair, and then the sheikh, the blind sheikh, comes in, Abdurrahman. Uh, Abdurrahman. Uh, Abdurrahman. Now I'm on a street corner in Jersey City with Abdurrahman after I'm in Egypt thinking, hmm, Sadat, look at that. He was killed here. Who ordered it? Who gave the fatwa? Well, it was the sheikh. Now I'm on the corner with the sheikh thinking, holy shit. Just a few years ago, I'm in Egypt in Cairo thinking, oh, Sadat is the one that... that you know. Are you talking to him? Yes, I'm jawing with him on, on the street corner. Uh, we were asked by my supervisor to go with INS, and they had deportation papers. But Kenny, you know, you know the uh, you know the people. You go with them. So, so you know, we we stake the place out. He comes out with his bodyguard driver, and uh, INS. I'm with two INS guys, and you know, we're all vested up. And uh, and the, the sheikh decides, uh, I, I don't accept uh, these papers. The government, your, your government sucks. Um, uh, and then the other guy starts, you know, reaching for, for stuff and the INS guys grab him and there's a tussle and uh, it's going to south. It's going south pretty, pretty quick. But I think the most embarrassing thing was the sheikh looks at me and he says, you, your Arabic sucks. <laughs> and when he says sucks, I mean, he, he called it a zift in Arabic, which literally means tar, but colloquially means shit. And, and that, that hurt my feeling more than anything else. <laughs> Don't you understand? I've studied my whole life yeah, to you, get here. You, you can't do that to me in front of all these people. Yeah. Is that guy still alive? No, he, he yeah. died. Um, I think he died in North Carolina, one of the uh, federal prisons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bad dude. Oh, very bad yeah. dude. Yeah, he was a rabble rouser. He was, you know, giving all the, you go, he, you, you can kill that one. And he was wiping out, uh, you know, other alpha uh, Muslims as well, like the... Uh, murder of Mustafa, Mustafa Shalabi in Coney Island. So he, he, he's the one that ordered that hit. So a very bad guy, very bad guy. But he was, so the one thing I've learned about those organizations, you cut the head off the snake, another one grows right back. Yeah, sure. You know, or a power vacuum yeah, happens. Sure, yeah. You know, so well, that, that's why he's trying to kill all the alphas, so they don't cut his snake. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you, you, you're speaking to him. What, what other... Um, yeah, interesting events happen because it seems like you, you're you're kind of like the Forrest Gump of the FBI at this yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, there was another. Uh, um, there was a Palestinian fella born in uh, Iraq who was kind of uh, snowing uh, one of our agents on the squad, and um, uh, this person said, "Oh, this we have a great informant. Uh, this informant is you know giving us uh, some good information about Iran." And I'm, I'm like, yeah, but what's the background of this person? Palestinian, Iraq? Uh, that's bullshit. I said, there's something wrong. Let me meet this guy. So the guy was, you know, look good, talk good, you know, living the American dream. You know, he's an assistant uh, uh, manager to a country club, the whole thing. But by night, you know, he's working for Saddam Hussein. You know, this is what we find out. And, you know, we get to know him. I, I get some sources. Uh, send them against him, and now we find out that he's. This is just before the uh, first Gulf War, that this guy is the messenger boy, and so he's he's going over. Oh, I'm just going to Jordan. Bullshit. Yeah. You know, we know we know that we, you know, we have we have friends over in Jordan, uh, but he was actually going to to Iraq to Baghdad, and he was doing the bidding of Saddam. You know, we want you to source stuff in the states. You know, if this war goes bad, you know, we need to get supplies, contracts. Uh, you know, you. You're in New Jersey. Make it happen. So I, I, I saw I saw through the guy pretty pretty quickly, and and we you know did this. He you know I asked him to come over to the uh, field office. We want to interview you. He comes over. He's got like two uh, two tape recorders in his pocket, and, but you know I have a source and the guy. So I knew. So I said, dump your pockets. And, oh, and I, you know I'm like oh you know pure theater. Oh, you would do this to me. Why? You know, oh, I, I'm your friend. You, well, well, I, I said, I don't record you. Why would you record me? You know, but this actually happened uh, one other time as well with uh, one of these uh, imams as well. The same thing. I'm going well, to record you. They're playing. They're doing a magic trick. <laughs> they're trying to say, look over here while the magic's happening over yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you move along in your career. How many years did you do there? So I just did three. I did three years with uh, JTTF, and then I, I got recruited uh, for an overseas um, uh, federal um, group, uh, uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, AID. 
And so I worked with the, their office of inspector general. And but you're still, you're still current FBI? No. No, I'm you not. left. No, I left. Okay. Yeah, I left. And so, wow. I, jo- so I joined this. Yeah, uh, you know, a- again, I like the overseas thing. And I, I realized in Newark, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to stay in the States. I'm not going to travel overseas. And I really like the overseas stuff. So, um, you know, I took this offer going overseas. And I ended up in uh, Central America. And was that vastly different? Because it took you away from this, that little nagging thing in the background that you always wanted to be involved in law enforcement. Did you stay there for a long time? No, but it was actually, you know, we did have badges. uh, We had guns. We had, uh, you know, know, we basically were working uh, white collar fraud cases. And I didn't know anything about it going in, but I I had been recruited by some ex-FBI guys uh, who knew fraud pretty well. And uh, I said, guys, I don't know anything about fraud. We'll teach you. They said, we'll teach you. And so that's what, that's what happened. So, I, you know, I went over, I work cases, I still work cases in the Middle East, but I, but I was in Central and South America doing a lot of work. And is that where you finished up your, your life in law enforcement? No. Uh, so f- I was there about seven years and then uh, was not uh, going anywhere uh, in the, um, you know, going up through the ranks. I kind of hit this wall. It's called management. <laughs> I just didn't get along with my supervisor, and I knew, um, you know, I, I was doing good work, I felt, but this person, there was kind of an anim- animosity uh, going on, and um, I, I just said, this this is real, I got to get out of here. And then someone, um, the Secret Service guy that I was telling you about with the uh, LBJ thing, mm-hmm. he, he was a supervisor in El Paso, and he, he called me, he said, I heard about you, I heard you do pretty good work, heard you speak Spanish. Um, how would you like to join uh, Department of Justice, uh, Office of Inspector General? And I'm like, thank you for throwing the life. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, I'll be down there tomorrow uh, type thing. But he, a uh, very nice guy. And uh, yeah, I ended up going out to the southwest border. This is this is amazing because, you know, you get the job as the FBI. You're, yeah. you're, that's it. Yeah, that's like, it. Yeah, you're... yeah, some people, that's it. You know, it's and a career. You, and you, that's it. You don't move on. But. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a legitimate G man at yeah, yeah, this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I, I understand that, that whole thing, but, um, you know, I, I like to open doors and see what's behind the next door. And, uh, to be, to be honest with you, um, I actually, I did a few years with this, this agency and then, um, again, not seeing it, it just wasn't working out. And so I said, I'll go back to the bureau. So I applied to go back for the bureau and I went through the whole process again and everything was going perfectly well until we got to the uh, color vision test. And then, uh, then I dis- discovered that I'm colorblind, you know, <laughs> red green deficiency. And, um, uh, which is strange because when because that, your book has <clears throat> red in it, uh, is that, is that what <laughs> that is? Okay. I thought it was yellow, but, uh, you know, when, when we uh, had the test uh, when I first joined, it was nothing more than uh, some agent coming in with the balls of yarn. And just like five balls of yarn, blue, red, green, uh, yellow. And, and you know, that, that's, that's not a problem for a colorblind person. You know, red or green in a ball of, you know, you can, that's, that's You easy. know yellow is, is red. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So there was no problem. Now I'm going back to, to try to get back into the bureau and they've changed the test. And now they, they're using Ishihara uh, plates where uh, you look at bubbles, colors, and you're supposed to find a number. In there, you know, if, if you're not colorblind, you're going to see this number. If you're colorblind, you're going to see the other number. Right. And and they said you fail, you're colorblind. So that kind of that kind of blew me away. I didn't know, you know, that I had that uh, <laughs> that deficiency. Well, it's yeah. just been normal to you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I re- later, I realized that you know, you guys, I guess, uh, you you see things uh, differently, certainly differently than I do. There's kind of more. It's just more color, more, it's more, it's brighter, more vibrant, more vibrant because I put on some lenses, you know, this is how uh, normal people see things. And I went, whoa, whoa, how do I get me a pair of these lenses? <laughs> see those videos of little kids doing <laughs> yeah. that. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the bureau, uh, and this was interesting and this uh, kind of uh, went off in a different direction, but the bureau said, we can't hire you because, um, and the reason is, uh, for example, if you do a search warrant and you describe things, uh, you could... F- screw up and then because of your color vision you know it might be you know the, the color of the house is is red and you said it's yellow or something i okay i never thought about yeah. it that way but that makes sense right so i i you know uh so 
um, I talked to an attorney who was pretty good in the Washington circles with feds. And uh, he said, no, 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 no. You, you have a beef with these people. He said, you know, you've got all these awards. Um, you know, you had one award that, you know, is like outstanding, outstanding that you can't talk about. And, and they're telling you that you cannot do the job. You did the job. So, you know, we, um, you know, we did this legal action, uh, against the Bureau and, uh, it took, it took a few years and, uh, actually we won, we won the, uh, won the case and they said, okay, you can come back to the Bureau. Now, three or four years has gone by, right? And, uh, I'm out in El Paso now. I've got a family, you know, I'm, I'm rising up through the ranks. I'm like the, uh, second in command. And, and so they said, okay, we'll take you back. Uh, but we have to bust you down, uh, two levels and you're going to Puerto Rico because you speak Spanish. So, uh, you that know, really stick it yeah, to you. Yeah, they, they always stick it to you. But what's interesting, and this is where I kind of, um, I, I kind of feel good about this. If anything, uh, I, I, without knowing it, I ended up paving the way for uh, men and women that came after me with the same yeah. deficiency because, uh, at, at the end of the day, they changed the test so that it wasn't as difficult with the Ishihara plates. They went to another test, which was much easier. Uh, so well, we did all scientific studies and stuff and, and proved that we, that those people could do the job. There was no problem. When was it time to hang up your spurs? Uh, 2010. Um, you know, I was, I was in El Paso, uh, doing uh, internal affairs. And what's interesting is, so I'm with the Bureau and now I'm with DOJ OIG and I'm investigating the Bureau, people in the Bureau, which, which was kind of ironic. And, and at the same time, working with them on cases because we're a small group and sometimes we need manpower. So you grab customs, you grab DEA, FBI. So it's just kind of interesting how that played out. But then we come to this fine piece of work over here. Why write a book? What, what was it? Was it something that was in you bubbling up or does it feel like you had a story to come out? Cops on you know, yeah. what, what's, what's the, the yeah. crux of that? Yeah. Great. That's a great question. So, you know, I suppose some of it is, is legacy. Uh, if, if nothing, you know, for my family, for my kids, grandkids, you know, what did, what did you do? Well, this is what I did. This is some of what I did. You get an idea. But, um, the, I remember talking to a guy, I was, um, I had a security job after government in Pasadena and, uh, I remember talking to this client and he said, uh, Hey, uh, tell me a story. And I'm like, huh? Tell me a story. You know, FBI, DOJ, just tell me something. I'm so curious. So I told the guy a story and he said, holy shit, that's, that's unbelievable. That's some, and I'm like, really? Oh yeah, man. That's, I've never heard this stuff. Oh, uh, you should write a book. So that kind of got me thinking. And a little light bulb goes off. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I should. And, um, I thought about it and I said, you know what? I have some interesting stories to tell. Um, you know, all, all of it is kind of uh, contemplative. It's a, it's a humanity more than anything else. It's, it's my success. It's my failure. It's the tragedy. And there, there, was, uh, there were a few. And there was, um, you know, comedy, you know, everyday comedy, right? Yeah. It's, it's all there. Uh, well, you it, just described police work pretty yeah, well. Okay. Exactly. It, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a shift in police work. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Success, failure, tragedy, right? A lot of comedy. Yeah. So, so Kevin, uh, this one podcaster, I, you know, I came out with the book, and one podcaster said, "Look, this is great. You got a book. Uh, so, look, I want the uh, biggest, the best case you ever had, the most arrests you made, the case with the uh, the biggest recoveries, financial recoveries. That's what we're going to talk about." And I, I said, "I don't think so. I don't think I'm going to work out for you. Yeah. Th this is not." That's, this is not that type of book. This is something a little deeper than that. I'm not beating my chest and saying, um, and, you know, really, probably my greatest success was the most subtle case that I kind of, you know, get been groomed, you know, in the Middle East. And I walked into a situation and like, whoa, you know, and you look back and say, that was cool. Yeah. That was very cool. But it's not the, uh, you know, $50 million recovery or 10 people I took down single-handedly or not, none of that stuff, no. Uh, <laughs> some people make a very good living on those big cases I, yeah, like I, that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I'm not yeah. going to, you know. Right. Just... 
Well, I'm looking forward. I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to to reading it. I I knew you were bringing us copies tonight, and I do want. I hope you are willing to sign us some copies. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and where can we find it? So you can find it on uh, Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble. Okay. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we're going to do a uh, paperback pretty soon. I want to do an audio book. You went. Well. You went bold. You went to hard copy, hardcover first. Yeah, this this publisher is like he's really into hardcovers, and he's a big uh, cover guy. He mm -hmm. says, you know, you got to get the cover right. And we worked on the cover for a long time, and worked on the title for a long time. Cover's got to be like grabbing. That's it. Yeah. That's what he said, man. He says you got to stop people to just come over and say, take a chance, right, on the book and. Well, where can we find you? Where can audience find you? I find you on yeah. Instagram all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm on all the social media uh, platforms, uh, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, that stuff. I also have an author uh, website, which is, uh, you know, www.kennethstrange.com well, as well. I've got a, another book. Uh, you know, I have a first book, which is self-published, but I have another book coming out on the Middle East uh, next year. It's called Land of Sand. I might have that princess story in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty interested. I, I have a feeling you're not telling us the whole story. Yeah, like, was she beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she was. Money, money seems to make people more beautiful, yeah, too. Um, we're coming to the end of this thing. Yeah. And I always end the show the same way. I ask the same question. <clears throat> it's you've gone through a lot of different things. You've seen the world. And you've seen all these different things uh, how other people suffer, how you've suffered, you, how you've watched other people go through certain things. But it's had to have taught you something, this this incredibly uh, civic-minded hmm. life from, you know, the way your father came up in NYPD yeah. to your life in government law enforcement. Yeah. What do you think that suffering has taught you? Uh, don't take your t yourself too seriously. Uh, you know, you, d you depend so much on your uh, fellow police officers yeah. Uh, not a one-man game. It's not a one-man show. I've learned that, and, uh, you know, I, I've always collaborated with other agencies. Uh, although the FBI had this reputation, I've never saw it where they would, you know, take in the glory and this, that. I never saw that personally, and I would never stand for something like that. But, uh, you know, I, I love to kind of spread it around. And many of the cases that I work, especially in the southwest border and with the cartels, and uh, I, I made sure that the bureau was involved. Customs was involved. It was like one one happy family, and we, we got along because we all had the same the same goal. You share. Yeah, we shared it. You share, and a high tide rises all boats. There you go. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming all this way. I loved it. I was looking forward to this. I know I was talking to Mike about it when we had our first phone call. I'm like, Mike, I got this. I I, I just got done talking to this guy. You're gonna like it. That's, so, th but thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. You guys, are terrific. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast with Kenneth Strange. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned here. Clean cops keep their dignity. King Kenneth sounds pretty nice. <laughs> Your path is often laid out for you. Law enforcement is success, failure, tragedy, and comedy. Forge relationships, they're important. But most importantly, don't take yourself too seriously. And that's going to do it for this episode. Don't forget to go to the Oakley Kitchen at 789 Bloomfield Avenue in Nutley. Great food, great environment. Go to popple.com for a digital business card. Put in the code TSP20 for a 20% discount. Find us on all social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, X. See, I got X right. LinkedIn, Clapper, uh, whatever, uh, fa Facebook. Fo and OnlyFans. <laughs> follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And, of course, follow Suffering Podcast. We'll see you on the next episode.